Thank you, Susan. Uh, appreciate it, the opportunity to be here to speak with you today. Um, uh, but first, I should apologize for the change in, in speakers. Uh, Maddie wasn't able to be here today because of personal matters. And, and uh, I, I, should, I should also say that uh, we, uh, we submitted a couple of abstracts to this, to this meeting. Um, didn't realize the, the, the length of the talk, so it's understandable that only one of those was accepted. But um, we've kind of blended the, the two talks. Uh, so not just about um, um, modeling and measuring drainage, but we're gonna include some uh, uh, ideas about leaching, nutrient leaching uh, through these forest water reclamation facilities. Uh, Eureka Joshi is uh, the, uh, largely responsible for um, uh, coordinating the development of these, uh, these facilities, uh, organizing these facilities to allow us uh, help and, and some of the adjacent landowners. Uh, Aaron, Aaron Brooks and Robert Heinze are experts on the hydrologic models that we've applied in this, um, in this project. So, uh, so here uh, is a picture of Coeur d'Alene Lake and an example of uh, some of the tremendous water resources that we have in Northern Idaho uh, region. Um, they're, of course, important to uh, foundation of the uh, in, uh, original indigenous tribal culture that existed in the area, still very important uh, to those folks, and also a focus of a, a, a very strong modern economy. Okay, you'll notice uh, also in this picture that there's some development around the edge of the lake. Uh, residence was on the shore and in the upland. And uh, of course, uh, the inevitable consequence of development is, uh, is wastewater production. Um, so uh, when, when uh, that, that effluent is, uh, uh, is collected uh, in, in many um, municipalities and, and uh, used, uh, they're, they're used to apply to a forest as a tertiary treatment. Um, so they're, they're pumped into a settling pond. Uh, it's it's uh, then aerated, disinfected, and applied to the, uh, to the, the forest. And then the forest is uh, accomplishing the, the tertiary treatment. Okay, so uh, I, as a as a forester, somebody that's interested in um, in forest management, was was really interested in what these treatments are doing to the to the growth of the trees in this in, in these facilities. So uh, um, it's kind of uh, interesting opportunity to uh, to study this. So this is uh, just a, a a sampling of. Uh, some 600 uh, tree cores that uh, Eureka will synthesize and present at the Society of American Foresters meeting next week in, in Baltimore. Um, let's see, is there, a, is there a pointer on this? Okay, well, uh, let me try and describe it. Um, uh, first of all, the, there's a couple of there, there's uh, some arrows here that indicate the initiation of the wastewater treatment, um, and and you can see that the growth of the tree rings expanded quite substantially, especially for western red cedar, the WRC in the first panel, um, uh, and and so the the ring widths increase quite substantially. Um, uh, Douglas fir also increases um, significantly, and uh, and at the at the Hayburn site in the lower panel, um, the initiation there was in 2010, and we see after that a response to the Ponderosa pond at that location. Okay, so so the wastewater is supplying water and nutrients to these to these trees. And the trees are filtering the material. The, the, the neat thing uh, about these facilities is that uh, is that the, the nutrients are being applied in an incremental amount. So um, and and that's uh, 
more akin to what the what the trees require. They 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 need uh, small amounts of, uh, of nutrients uh, on a, on a regular basis, um, and that's that's quite different from how we typically fertilize forests within the region, where we take a a large amount of uh, fertilizer, apply it once during the rotation, um, and we get a, we get a, a somewhat of a stimulation of growth, maybe uh, maybe ten to thirty percent growth for a few years, um, and then that uh, that tapers back down to the original level. Well, these uh, at these wastewater facilities, they're they're seeing <clears throat> uh, some twenty to sixty percent growth, and that's occurring in a in, in a consistent manner over uh, over the the life of the treatment so uh, quite uh, quite substantial increase in in productivity within northern idaho there's scores of of these facilities that are uh, uh, applying wastewater to forests and what we call a forest water reclamation facility uh, we're working with the the five uh, indicated in in red on on this okay so the uh, department of Environmental quality in Idaho regulates uh, the amount of uh, load that can be applied to the forest the, the, uh, based on the irrigation water requirement. Okay? And so that's, that's determined based on the, uh, the potential evaporation from, for, for the site. Uh, usually it's, it's focused on a reference crop, and then that's discounted for the, for the crop that happens to be growing there. In this case, uh, we, we're using a crop coefficient. Of, of 0.7. So uh, uh, the, the amount of water that can be applied is about 70% of what that uh, reference crop could, could be applied. And this is, uh, these, these permits uh, are, allow a certain amount of, uh, of uh, ir irrigation water requirement on a monthly basis. And the, the idea is, uh, of course, to, to maintain the effluent uh, application lower than the irrigation water requirement. The trees will use that water, will transpire that water, so not a lot of that, uh, the wastewater is released to the in environment. Okay, so the idea is to maintain uh, at or below the irrigation water requirement and to avoid any types of uh, over irrigation, uh, as indicated on the on the edges of the, the growing season. Keeping that irrigation water requirement uh, below the the requirement of the okay. So so for this project, we had uh, we had several objectives. One was to measure the drainage uh, within these facilities and uh, and to use the measurements of drainage to uh, parameterize hydrologic models so that we could measure drainage on. Uh, uh, numerous locations. We can only measure uh, drainage at a few locations and, and had um, nutrient concentrations from several locations. And we wanted to decide if there was any leaching of nutrients or, or to quantify the amount of leaching of nutrients from these. And so our working hypothesis is that land application to forests doesn't um, allow any nutrients to leach from these uh, facilities. Okay, just a couple of uh, examples of the of the, uh, uh, the pond at um, at one facility and the forest application. The, a picture of of Maddie that you unfortunately don't get to see today. Um, okay, so a little bit about the the experimental design, the facilities themselves. This is a, a, a from those facilities that we selected, uh, Eureka was able to develop a time series of application rates. So, so we've got facilities that have been treated for over 40 years and some that are, uh, and one that's uh, only been treated for eight years at this point. At each facility, we've uh, installed uh, forestry um, uh, measuring plots at, at each one where we're also taking, taking some of these samples. Half of those plots are within the management unit, and the other half of the plots are in the surrounding, the area surrounding that. And, and you can see on this uh, graph there of uh, northern Idaho, this image of northern Idaho, there's uh, uh, the, the outline of Lake Pendere and Lake Coeur d'Alene, and these facilities are, are on the edge of these um, tremendous water resources that we have. Okay, so, so uh, 
we can look at the records uh, from these facilities and try and decide about what the cumulative loading rate was. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have good records past uh, uh, before the year 2000, so, so that had to be extrapolated back to um, the initial, uh, the, the initiation of the facility. And you can see that um, uh, here in, in these graphs, uh, some are uh, receiving, uh, the, these facilities are receiving between 16 and 46 pounds of nitrogen per year and uh, seven to 21 pounds of phosphorus per year. We can, uh, so that's a, uh, uh, one illustration of, of the uh, nutrient loading rates. Here's another illustration of nutrient loading rates where we have this, um, this uh, cumulative um, total uh, listed based on the establishment date of each of the facilities. So there is a, a large uh, amount of cumulative loading at the older facility and a smaller amount at the younger facility. And so um, uh, in, in addition to that uh, hypothesis that suggests that um, uh, we wouldn't see any, any, uh, any effect on leaching uh, due to the, to the loading rates, so we, can, we can draw a corollary to that and say that there wouldn't be any type of correlation to uh, uh, if there was any type of correlation um, uh, to the to the uh, to this loading rate diagram, it would suggest that there was some leaching that occurred. So we don't expect to see this type of a of an, um, a sloped uh, negative slope graph with establishment at these facilities. Okay, so uh, one of the first objectives that we had was to measure measure drainage, and to do that, uh, we installed drain gauges. Um, uh, and these drain gauges consist of uh, a 10 inch diameter uh, steel cylinder that's driven into the ground to collect an intact soil core. And then that, uh, that intact soil core is, is uh, taken to the, the installation site within the plot. The core is collected near the, near the plot and, and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, intact core or diversion tube is taken to the, the site and placed on top of a reservoir within, uh, within the hole that has, has been prepared. Okay, and then, oh, then we would fill that in. We had a couple of different types of drain gauges. Uh, uh, Eureka was uh, able to, uh, was awarded a, a Harris Fellowship from the meter group and she received five of their G3 drain, drain gauges. So these are commercial drain gauges uh, centered around these, these steel cylinders. Um, and our, uh, uh, our hydrologists that were working with us suggested that perhaps one drain gauge per each of the facilities was, was not sufficient. And so, uh, so then uh, Maddie went about um, uh, applying Flint Hall's uh, handmade drain gauge approach. Um, uh, Flint, Flint Hall is a colleague of Aaron Brooks, who of course is uh, one of the hydrologists working with us here. So we had some confidence in that would work. Uh, she, she developed these, uh, um, these handmade drain gauges and we installed uh, uh, 10 of those. So we had three uh, drain gauges at each of the five facilities for a total of five, uh, for, for a total of 15 drain gauges. And of course, um, among the five sites, we had we had fifteen we had fifty plots, and so we needed to understand uh, uh, how that drainage extrapolated out to those other plots. And so we were using the models, the hydrologic models, to predict what drainage was from from the uh, drain gauge measurement. Just give you an idea of uh, oh uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, that's why I need the, the uh, presenter view is to remember what my slides are. Um, uh, so uh, each one of these uh, uh, drain gauge units had uh, a couple of soil uh, moisture probes in them, tensiometers at, at 10 centimeters and, and 50 centimeters. There was also a, a pressure sensor within the reservoir of the drain gauge to track the level of that. Um, uh, the data loggers were downloaded and the, the, uh, the, the reservoir sampled for nutrient analysis and emptied on a monthly basis. 
Okay, so here's a, a little bit of the, the uh, data from that. Let me walk you through this kind of complicated uh, table uh, across the top. You can see the five facilities uh, named and uh, along the left edge are the, the months of the samples that, uh, that we collected. Within we, each of the columns for the, the um, for the facility, there is a control column and two columns for effluent. So C is for control, E is for effluent. And um, we had two drain gauges in uh, uh, effluent plots. There, was a, there, there were uh, two plots that, had, um, uh, that were treated with effluent that had drain gauges and one plot that uh, was not treated with effluent that had a drain gauge. So these are the 15. Uh, drain gauges within each of the with, within the entire study. Okay, so uh, just a, just a, uh, an idea. We see a, we see a strong seasonal pattern. Probably not surprising in this in in this um, uh, uh, environment where we have wet winters and dry summers. Um, but uh, it, it, none of these uh, facilities did we see any type of drainage from. Uh, from any of the, the drain gauges during the dry summer months of July and August. Uh, I should also mention, um, you'll notice that at Cave Bay, the control plot uh, never gave us any drainage, okay? So there was probably something wrong with the installation of that. Maybe the reservoir is broken, um, uh, we don't know. And also at Ellisport, the control plot there uh, collected more drainage than was supplied through precipitation. So uh, something of a mystery of where that water is coming from, but uh, in, in general, uh, uh, it, uh, although there were a couple of problems, we saw some pretty consistent patterns. One, of course, is this dry um, uh, dryness in the, in the summertime. And then uh, we also saw most of our drainage occurring over the winter time. So uh, very, very strong seasonal pattern. Uh, the other the other point to uh, uh, to make here it's not really easy to see within the data the way it's presented but there was a statistically significant um, effect of effluent on these plots so there was a there was a higher drainage from the effluent plot okay so we wanted to uh, evaluate uh, this um, the, the drainage measurements that we have, uh, and here is a, a just just trying to to understand what our application rates can be and and uh, how this tool can help us monitor this. Uh, in this graph, there is uh, it's it's uh, listing monthly drainage, and and the line with the blue blue symbols uh, is is one is the one control at this facility and the green and red line are the measured um, drainage from the two effluent plots. Okay, so uh, uh, you'll see that those drop to zero over the growing season. Uh, the growing season is indicated by the, the uh, yellow square. Um, uh, and so there's no drainage during, during the growing season and drainage uh, uh, picks up uh, in the autumn and, and, and then drops back down in the spring. Okay, also on this graph is the uh, illustration of the irrigation water requirement that's permitted for, for this facility. Uh, and, and that's uh, in the white shading and the gray shading uh, is uh, how much irrigation was actually applied. Okay, so these guys are applying very little uh, um, uh, irrigation at, at this facility and, and that is, um, uh, not allowing any type of drainage. But as, as we all know, things can happen uh, when we're operating uh, mechanical systems. And uh, at this other facility, uh, turned out that they're, um, they had some mechanical problems and could not start to apply uh, their irrigation water um, uh, as planned in the, in the beginning of the, the summer. And so by the time they got uh, uh, things fixed in July, they had to um, uh, catch up. And so they were applying at the irrigation water requirement. And you can see, especially at the edge of the season where there's also some precipitation that, that comes in uh, that should be accounted for, um, 
regardless, there was a little bit of, uh, of drainage that occurred as a result of this. So, so uh, that irrigation water requirement is, is, is helpful, is a useful tool to understand um, whether, whether drainage is, is, effect, is, is, is happening based on the irrigation that we're, we're applying. Okay, so we'd like to expand the measurements that we have on the 15 plots out to the 50 plots so that we can determine what leaching is because we have uh, nutrient measurements, uh, uh, soil water measurements from all of the 50. So we use these two uh, hydrologic models. Hydrus one is a, is a very detailed process model um, and uh, WEP or the um, water erosion prediction project model is a watershed model. Um, and and we've, uh, we use the drainage data and some other data from each of the facilities, such as their physical soil uh, uh, characteristics, to, to simulate drainage, or, well, to, to uh, first of all, to uh, parameterize the models with the drainage data that we had, and then, and then we would use those parameterized models to simulate drainage from all of the sites. So this is, uh, this graph shows the, uh, the predicted, uh, the observed versus, versus predicted, um, and the, the statistics at the top indicate the fit. Uh, these, uh, um, uh, both the nash Sue cliff and the uh, coefficient of determination, the R-squared, um, should ideally be 1.0 for a perfect fit. So uh, we're doing quite, quite well with these, especially with the hydras. We've got a, a, a much better fit than, than wet, but all of, uh, both of these are, are predicting quite well uh, drainage. We feel, uh, have some good confidence in these models. Okay, so we've got, we've measured drainage, we've predicted drainage at all the sites. We need to, uh, we need to measure uh, uh, the nutrient concentration of the soil water. So we sampled soil water using tension lysimeters. Here's a photograph of uh, Eureka getting her exercise for the day, um, drilling down to 75 centimeters with, a, with an auger. And uh, then, then we would, um, uh, once that hole was pre prepared, we would pour in a slurry of uh, silica flour and uh, uh, quickly insert our uh, tension lysimeter, the ceramic cup of the tension lysimeter into the, into the bottom of the hole at 75 centimeters. And that would allow a strong matrix connection with the, uh, between the lysimeter and the soil water. So we could apply a vacuum to that on a, uh, we, we would come back monthly, apply a vacuum, uh, come back the next day to, to collect the sample that we could analyze for nutrients. So this is uh, how we sampled soil water. Okay, so here's some of the results we got from those, those uh, soil water uh, uh, samples. Um, and, and we're going to be talking about ammonium, phosphate, and nitrate in, in each of these graphs that we're looking at here. And so this is the concentration of those uh, nutrient elements um, at each of the seasons when, when we sampled. We sampled these, uh, uh, sorry, I said monthly. We did not sample them monthly. We sampled them quarterly. Um, and so these are the samples, the, the, the measurements that we got. So first of all, notice that ammonium and phosphate really have no effect of effluent on the nutrient concentration. Um, and uh, there, there did seem to be a bit of a seasonal pattern in the ammonium, but that uh, was only in the first year where, there, where it was somewhat, somewhat of a peak, um, but that didn't appear in the, the uh, second year of sampling. There were some significant differences between sampling dates, but no, never any treatment uh, effects for either of these uh, two nutrients. And so, uh, but then on the other hand, nitrate, we see a pretty consistent uh, seasonal pattern, a, a peak in uh, nitrate concentration during the fall. Um, and then that drops off over winter and spring and, uh, and back again the next fall. So uh, may, maybe there's a, a, a seasonal pattern and there was very consistently higher values, but only one of those was, uh, was significant. When we look at all of the data together, we do get a significant effect of, of effluent on, on nitrogen, statistically speaking. 
Okay, so uh, then we can uh, also look at leaching. So we have the drainage values, the, the, uh, 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 the drainage flux times the, uh, times the concentration gives us the, the leaching value. And, um, and you'll, you'll see here that because we see a strong seasonal pattern in drainage, then um, uh, we also end up with a seasonal pattern in leaching. But again, for ammonium and phosphate, it's difficult to distinguish any treatment effects uh, between effluent and control. However, we see a, 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 a ever increasing uh, seasonal pattern with leaching, right? There's a, there's a subtle seasonal pattern with concentration. There's a strong seasonal pattern with drainage. And so in the end, we find leaching um, has, a, has a strong seasonal pattern. And there is also uh, Im important treatment effects. So we're, we are losing some nitrate from these, uh, from these forest water reclamation. Okay, this is just a different way of looking at it. It gets back to the diagram that I showed you earlier, uh, where we were applying loading rates, um, and uh, and you you saw that there was a negative slope for those for those uh, uh, treated plots of different age, and so we're looking for that pattern in in these diagrams set up similar way, um, and and with the ammonium and phosphate for concentration. Uh, we really don't see any uh, treatment effects. Okay, so there, there, there is a somewhat of a of an effect of the slope of the line um, uh, based on the establishment date, but um, but the, the the lines don't really separate for for ammonium and uh, phosphate concentration. Uh, when we uh, uh, calculate leaching, uh, if you'll recall, I mentioned that there was a significantly different. Um, uh, difference between uh, drainage uh, in the effluent and the control plots that shows up here as a as a, a small treatment effect for uh, phosphate and ammonia. So it looks like there might be a little bit of uh, leaching of these, but it's it's uh, pretty minor. Um, now, when we look at nitrate, we see there is uh, a quite a a substantial slope there. And so there may actually be a correlation between the loading rates and the nitrate leaching rates. And so this is a, an, an example that, uh, showing that here. So both for nitrate concentration and uh, leaching, we see there are some nitrates being lost. And it looks, so it looks like there may be some, uh, uh, some saturation, some nitrogen saturation that's occurring in these older facilities that's allowing nitrate to leak. To be lost. Okay, so um, uh, I, I think I'm just going to uh, uh, pass on. Was it, was that ten minutes till the end of thirty minutes or to the end of forty minutes? Okay, so let me just let me just skip over this. Uh, really interesting uh, results that we're seeing uh, for phosphorus, so where we measure uh, where we measure we're, we're seeing some preferential flow through the drain gauges as opposed to those matrix samples, but um, uh, let me just focus here now on, um, keep, keep the focus on, on the nitrate and nitrification. Um, I, uh, I, I asked a, a, an undergraduate that we have, uh, very unusual to find an undergraduate in natural resources that likes to do lab work, but this, uh, this student was really interested in some of the work we were doing. So I asked her to look at nitrification and uh, the abundance of the ammonium uh, oxidizers within the soil. Um, nitr nitrification, of course, is the oxidation of ammonium. So if there's uh, ammonium present and nitrifiers are present and it's properly aerated, um, then nitrate might be uh, produced. And uh, nitrate, this, this reaction is, is uh, catalyzed by the ammonium monooxygenase enzyme. And, uh, and that is coded with the AMOA, AMOA, gene within these nitrifying organisms, unique to these organisms. And so if we can find this gene at a, at a location, we can quantify how much, how many nitrifiers are there. What's the abundance of nitrifiers there at that, that location? So if there's, uh, if there's ammonium there, uh, that increases, the nitrifiers will increase and nitrification might increase as a result. Okay. So uh, nitrification is measured just with a standard split sample 
uh, analysis where uh, a sample is, uh, half the sample is an analyzed initially for nitrate and ammonium. And then after a 28 day incubation, that sample is again analyzed. And the difference between that is a measure of nitrification and ammonification. We're focusing here just on nitrification. Um, and and uh, again, the same uh, uh, representation of the plot, we're seeing kind of an interesting response to the controls where it's actually um, lower in the older facilities and higher in the younger facilities. Um, but uh, regardless, there's quite a, an important separation between the, the control and the treated facilities, um, the older facilities, but there's no separation at the younger facilities. So we're seeing that there is nitrification increasing at these facilities. Um, and then uh, if, if any of you are familiar with this uh, uh, qPCR assay, it's a genetic assay. This is just a um, uh, amplification plot that uh, Bailey uses to, to represent this, this assay, um, and where she's looking for the abundance of the um, a, a MOA gene. And you can see that there's a really strong, uh, uh, again, relationship between the facility age and the concentration of the MOA gene, especially relative to those controls. Okay, so um, now, uh, just, just some of the conclusions that we can draw from this uh, nutrient concentrations uh, below rooting zone is uh, uh, well within the safe water standards. Um, I, 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 I guess I failed to, to uh, point that out that um, all of the, uh, let me just go back and show you some of those. So some of those numbers, right? The, the, the phosphate levels, uh, if we think of uh, safe, safe surface water, standards of one milligram per, per liter, we've got phosphate concentrations coming out the bottom of, of uh, the, the rooting zone within these forests, uh, very, very low compared to um, that one milligram rate. And uh, if nitrate, the drinking water standard is 10 milligrams uh, per liter, then uh, the nitrate uh, coming out, filtering from these is, uh, is adequately treating that. So the, 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 um, the point of my conclusion is that these, uh, these facilities are effectively treating the wastewater. There's, there are seasonal patterns of drainage, not, not to be surpri not surprising in, this, um, uh, in this, uh, this climate that we have. Uh, the, the concentrations of ammonium and phosphate aren't really affected by the treatment, um, but because there's, uh, because there's leaching, um, uh, because there's drainage, there is some leaching that, uh, of these, some small amount of leaching. Uh, from these uh, effluent facilities, but it's the nitrate that's uh, uh, really uh, uh, seeing a, a loss of, um, uh, from the facility. So it suggests that these facilities may become nitrogen saturated over uh, uh, decades of service that we're, within, that we're observing within this, this study. Um, uh, I didn't talk about the preferential flow about phosphate, but it, uh, it's, a, it's a poorly understood process that we really need to um, uh, look at further and we're seeking, seeking funding to do that. Um, the older facilities uh, have greater nitrification rates and nitrifying bacteria. And uh, so uh, uh, some concern again about nitrogen saturation. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of interested in these uh, relatively straightforward uh, lab, lab tests of nitri nitrification and the nitrifying um, uh, Bacteria, the, um, uh, looking at the quantity of the AMOA gene, uh, it, it, this, this is a nice test bed, this, these uh, wastewater facilities to demonstrate its, its uh, effectiveness, but it also might be applied to uh, agricultural fields that might see uh, an excess of uh, nitrogen uh, application. Are they saturated or are natural, uh, natural systems subject to, um, to nitrogen deposition uh, of coming uh, nitrogen saturated? So anyway, those are, uh, those are some of the conclusions I, I really need to uh, acknowledge and, and um, uh, not, not only uh, the, the efforts of uh, the, the uh, Eureka to put together this, uh, this organization of folks, but also the folks that uh, were helping with us. Uh, we, we saw quite a bit of assistance from, from uh, Matt Playstead here in, in Coeur d'Alene to help us identify facilities that might be um, uh, appropriate for our, for our study. 
Um, also, um, the, uh, the operators of these facilities have been really, um, really cooperative and, and useful. Bob Hansen at, uh, uh, operates both Garfield and, and Bottle Bay facility. Um, uh, Chris Husick and Nathan Blackburn helped us at, uh, at Hayburn. Um, Bex Vogel uh, was really instrumental and, in, in, in fact, uh, assisted us with installation of the drain gauge, learning how to install the drain gauges. Um, uh, uh, Michael Morris and Leonard Johnson at, uh, at, at Cave Bay. But also, pl please realize that uh, these facilities are surrounded by land that uh, we, we were requesting access to, to put in our control plots. A lot of those were, were tribal lands, Coeur d'Alene, Kalispell tribes uh, assisted with us, the U.S. Forest Service assisted with us, and, and um, uh, let's see, Dale Vanstone, the private landowner at, at Ellis Bay. So, so we really appreciate the, the assistance of all those folks. And um, I'll take any, any questions while we, while we look at it, uh, Lake, Lake Ponderé. Great, thank you, Dr. Coleman. Um, and then we do have time for a few questions. Um, if you have a question, please come use the microphone in the um, center aisle here. My name is Jim Kimball. I'm ex-regional supervisor for CE2, and then I'm also my own company, designed several land treatment systems up in this area for you know, cottonwood and others. But it's interesting that these are mostly septic tank effluent and lagoon treatment systems. I think they're class C typically. But the loading rate that when we go through the DEQ criteria, like I'm looking at hybrid poppers, I like those, I'm planning a couple now. The loading rate is like up to 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre based on the tree consumption. And we like to stick it, you know, no more than about 150. And looking at some of the, your loading, they're way down there. So it's, it's kind of a, and even a, a small amount of leaching occurs even at these low loading rates. So it's, it's the difficult that that correction factor between the irrigation water requirement and what you're actually permitted is that big gap that we try to fill. How can we fill that gap that here's what we could based on the evapotranspiration rate in that and versus the actual capacity of the roots to take up the nutrient. And then like you have a sandy soil and you have your you know, allowable um, mat, it's called mat, mat uh, measured allowable um, deficiency technique, which it really gets technical. So how do you see, when you look at the light loading rates, how do you see the ability as we go up to the theoretical after, you know, uptake rate of say hybrid poppers even at 150 pounds compared to you're looking at down in the 20 or 30 pounds of nitrogen for native forest. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, they allow maybe 30 pounds or 40 pounds per acre and the criteria maybe up to 70 pounds for a pine forest, a young one. So I'm, I'm trying to see how the, the difference, if you were designing something with these higher rates um, and what's the best monitoring technique to determine compliance, is the piezometer, the stuff lysimeter, those things the best? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, I think it's important. You know, the, this, I've, I've um, uh, you visited with several, um, you know, waste poplar wastewater treatment facilities, um, but uh, mo most of the most of the monitoring is with perimeter wells, and there hasn't been a lot of uh, monitoring within within the plots. Uh, poplar has um, a, a much greater, faster growth rate than than pines, and uh, they have a, a much higher water requirement too. But uh, uh, of course, um, uh, there there's there's a distinction between the the, the water. Um, uh, requirement and the, the the water loading the hydraulic loading rates and the nutrient loading rates right if the if the concentration is is high then maybe you're not going to be able to put out as much as much water but um, you know I, uh, so, so it's it's important to, to uh, consider um, both the the constituent and the hydraulic loading 
Um, but if, if we were to, to evaluate that, um, it it's, seems to me that 100 pounds per acre per year is uh, is quite a high loading rate, and and we've we've seen um, you know there's uh, I can I can share with you some some literature that that, that talks about applications you know split applications over time and the, the um, amounts of, of that can be applied uh, versus a single single dose and the and the uh, effects on on leaching um, uh, these these uh, tension lysimeters are, are are a way to to sample that soil water and understand what the concentration is. Uh, we can certainly use a model to predict what the drainage might be from that location. And if we can see an elevated concentration of, of nutrients in that, in that soil water below the, the poplar, then it would suggest that, there, uh, that the nitrogen loading rate uh, should be backed off. Uh, you know, that, that, that it's, uh, uh, you know, wh whether or not uh, uh, there is leaching from uh, hybrid poplar plantations, I, I know of a couple maybe in, um, in Hayden that you, you might be working with, um, uh, you know, the, those are fairly young. They're not, they're not 30 or 40 years old, whereas uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing leaching losses, these low annual application rates in these older facilities. So they're getting quite a, quite a long um, uh, load over, over decades of time, regular application. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I've, but basically the, the root zone, what we're, we're looking at, maybe if you have a, a hybrid poplar or even a tree is like 40 inches or so that you can count in your available water capacity and your, your pour and your capillary rate. But if we have a grass or something like that, like a golf course or even a field, we try to match exactly as close as we can. When we apply it, we meet that irrigation water requirement, which is almost impossible to do because you've got to apply at a rate less than the uh, gravity flow. And so it's pretty complicated I'm getting into. I have a soil scientist I'm working with on in Washington who's done a lot of work on irrigating crops, you know, as far as in managed uh, allowable depletion. So there's a, quite a theoretical way to do it that you've got to get into to, to play with these things. But the, luckily the the systems you looked at are all pretty much recreational, higher flows in the summer, and all that versus year round, but you have your storage in that, but you got then six months of storage in a lagoon to have all this denitrification stuff, just a comment. All right, that's a, all the time that we have for this session. Um, so I'm going to, uh, yeah, thank you again, Dr. Coleman, and I will release everyone to lunch. If you have a CEU sheet, please do not forget to pick it up right by the door. Amanda has those sheets for you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your conference.